Well, I thought I would take a slightly different perspective today. Um, but um, before I do that, let's, let's just take care of some business. I don't accept money and have never accepted money uh, from the tobacco industry. I uh, uh, have in the past, but I have not for the past eight years accepted uh, uh, any funds, uh, research dollars from private sector agencies, including the pharmaceutical sector. I do uh, consulting and have received fees from public and, uh, er, and uh, uh, non-profit groups. Well, <clears throat> let's uh, start with a little brief history to remind ourselves. Um, this is, happens to be one of my public health heroes, a lovely man named Sir Richard Dahl. And he is uh, famous, of course. Uh, he was involved in uh, conducting the uh, British Physicians uh, Trial and uh, was part of a number of people who came together in the uh, early part of the last century uh, to demonstrate that in fact tobacco is a risk factor for premature mortality and related to a whole series of diseases. That same study later provided some pretty compelling evidence that in fact quitting uh, smoking uh, reduces uh, your risk uh, and in fact the earlier you quit the more profound the benefit. So uh, with that piece of information then we launched in, uh, we started to think about tobacco as largely a behavioral problem and uh, we began setting up all kinds of uh, counseling programs, initially fairly intensive group-based programs and so forth and uh, in fact uh, while some of them were uh, quite successful with some individuals it became apparent that there were large numbers of people that we were not having the desired effect with. And in fact, over time, uh, what we saw is that our impact in these sorts of interventions has been diminishing. Well, that led to the notion of a whole bunch of uh, additional work, and we began to understand that, uh, at least for some individuals, uh, there's a whole bunch of brain chemistry that's uh, happening and important changes in a way that produces what we now refer to as nicotine addiction. That then led us to uh, the notion of developing pharmaceutical-based interventions to help um, modify and alter that brain chemistry or to, uh, to effectively account for some of the uh, changes. Um, and uh, that then led to the use of clinical practice guidelines, uh, encouraging people to use more pharmaceutical interventions, using brief counseling as an important adjunct uh, to uh, pharmaceutical aids and to get more healthcare providers uh, across the board involved in cessation. And again, uh, very successful, very useful. We, uh, we should be very proud of the accomplishments, uh, but as I'll come back to later, it still may not be enough. Some of the limitations of this particular approach is that, again, like behavioral interventions on their own, most people still prefer to quit and are able to quit what we presume is on their own. Less than half of the people in various studies, including some work that I've done, would be described as having moderate to high levels of nicotine dependence. There's an increasing clustering of smokers, um, and regrettably, many of those folks don't have consistent access uh, to medical intervention. And I think we need, it, there's a bit of an elephant in the room, we need to acknowledge the fact that there is some uh, evidence biased decision making that is taking place uh, until Ron Borland and, and others uh, around the world came together and showed that we can use rigorous designs in terms of the evaluation of policy. The vast majority of our evidence was reduced to randomized controlled trials, which meant that uh, we were restricted to studying and rigorously defending those interventions that lent themselves to trials. It also needs to be said that, uh, in fact, there are some potential conflicts of interest, that many of the people that were involved in the construction of guidelines, and I uh, include myself in, in uh, this group, uh, had conflicts of interest. And although they may never have intentionally ever tried to to manipulate the data, what we do know is uh, that in fact it does have a subtle but important effect in terms of how we interpret data. 
Now, along in a parallel track, uh, there are a group of researchers led by people like uh, uh, Rose, Ted Marmot, um, and in fact, they began to look at things like cardiovascular disease, and this is a particular graph that uh, is probably familiar to many of you, um, looking at the famous Whitehall study of British civil servants. And uh, you notice several things about this. The first uh, thing is that, uh, in fact, depending on your social class, uh, you're at various levels of risk, and those who are at the uh, top of the food chain were at the least amount of risk for developing uh, cardiovascular disease, or in this case, coronary heart disease. And uh, the more disadvantaged you were uh, in terms of the social hierarchy, the greater your risk. Uh, the second thing that is startling is the amount of unexplained variance. So after we took out what we knew about things like cholesterol and blood pressure and smoking, uh, that there was still an enormous amount of unexplained variance of what was going on and why this effect was occurring. And of course, over time, we began to think about um, these kinds of data as the social gradient. And this happens to be from one of my uh, colleagues uh, from Canada. And uh, it, this happens to be a study of, of multiple cities, uh, in fact, over 500 cities from around the world. And when you plot them according to income distribution, uh, you get this very interesting linear relationship between income distribution and uh, mortality. So far, so good. Well, then that led to a whole discussion, well, why should it be? How should income and income distribution more specifically be related to mortality? And a variety of hypotheses were developed, including the notion that inequality reduces or undermines something called social capital. And social capital is a community level variable that denotes a sense of connectedness, a level of trust between us as human beings. Okay, so far so good. Everybody's with me? Good. We already knew this. It wasn't worth getting out of bed early this morning just to hear this. Okay. Well, I wondered whether social capital might be related to smoking, and so um, I had a small sample of 80,000 uh, Canadians, and I looked at their level of connectedness and whether it might impact on their uh, tobacco use. And sure enough, there's quite a profound impact. There's a direct relationship, and the more connected you feel to your communities, the less likely you are to start smoking. Now, what isn't shown in this particular uh, graph is that there's also an interaction with age, and the younger you are, the more profound that effect is. In fact, almost uh, twice as many uh, young people who feel disconnected from their communities are likely to smoke relative to those who have strong connections to their neighbors and to their local communities. So my thesis this morning is simply this. Let's turn our thinking upside down, shall we? I would argue that for a long time, and for very good reasons, it served us well. I don't mean to be overly uh, critical here. I'm just saying, if we're looking forward, if we want to take up Ron's challenge that we need to do more, then let's start turning our thinking upside down as a starting place. So instead of thinking about uh, smoking or tobacco use and tobacco cessation as a medical issue that has some social implications, Let's think about it as a social challenge that has medical implications. And so if we start with that, then that leads, I would argue, to some interesting opportunities. So consider this. Scott Leatherdale and I uh, did some work a few years ago, and we found that in young people, just being exposed to individuals who are smoking, perfect strangers for the most part, can actually increase your likelihood that you in sec will start to smoke. Well, that's kind of a social influence thing. Well, we of course weren't the first to look at this and people have been thinking about uh, you know, social roles and smoking for a long time. And in fact, the vast majority of work in this area has been focused on the role of social support as an interpersonal transaction, typically between two people. 
where I provide you instrumental support, operational support, emotional support, informational uh, support, etc. And regrettably, the effects have not been. Now, there was a recent uh, Cochrane review, and regrettably, the effects have not been as strong as we might have expected. But the review also pointed out that there's a very complicated uh, set of assumptions that we often make in many of the studies, and they're really sort of crude calculations and correlations that, that we're depending upon. And that the nature of social support and who we have support with and the context with which that support occurs can have profound effects on our overall results, and we haven't yet fully appreciated those subtleties. A group of people have taken it further and they've started to talk about something called social integration and that's participation and integration within a broad uh, number of social relationships. And then more recently we've begun talking about social networks. This is an interactive web of people who influence each other, some of whom in that network haven't actually met face to face and are connected through other people. Okay, so that's the important point. Some of the people in your network you may not have had direct access to. We'll come back to that. So in terms of social support and integration, as I mentioned, there have been some small but um, largely inconsistent effects with respect to social support. In terms of integration, uh, it's a complicated picture. It depends on the level of trust that you have in the person who's trying to aid you. Uh, it depends on uh, the other person's smoking status and their attitudes towards smoking, a whole series of variables. But there is some sort of encouraging news. So here's a, one particular study from uh, Cohen and colleagues from a few years ago showing that, uh, that it's not the picture we expected, but there is a relationship. And that is the more social integration you have, the more cigarettes you smoke. Now, that's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? But think about it. Who are you most likely to have the social integration with? If you're a smoker, it's other smokers. Okay, so suddenly we're starting to see some of the, the subtle effects. Again, uh, Scott Leatherday and I uh, uh, looked at some uh, work. What we found is the effects if you're a young person uh, in a secondary school, the number of close friends that you have that are continuing to smoke impact your likelihood of being able to quit. And the more close friends you have who smoke, the less likely you are to quit. And the odds of that change profoundly. A few years ago, some work came out that for me was an epiphany. A couple of fellows named Kostakis and Fowler out of the United States used data from the Framingham study where they followed 12,000 people over a course of 32 years. What they found was that, guess what, if your spouse smokes, you're, 50, you're more likely to smoke. If your spouse quits, you're also more likely to be successful in quitting. Same thing with your sibs. Um, that wasn't a real big shock. The fact that our friends influenced us, uh, again, whether they quit or not, um, again, not a big shock. What was a shock was that, in fact, your neighbor has no effect on you unless they happen to be in your social network, unless you name them as part of your network. And perhaps the most profound aspect of their work is that it's not just your friends who influence your smoking status or it turns out your level of happiness or whether you're obese or whether you're de depressed or not or a whole series of variables, that those relationships within a network have what are called three degrees of separation. That is to say, it's not just your friends, but your friends' friends that influence you. And the friends of your friends' friends actually have an impact on your likelihood of quitting or not. Now think about this. Think about in your own life. Think about a friend. How many of your friend's friends do you know and have you met? How many of your friend's friend's friends have you actually met and do you know? Now, through something that researchers call homophily, we, we tend to associate with people who have certain similar characteristics and so on and so forth. So it's not unlikely that, that the friends of your friends uh, will have certain similar characteristics and so on and so forth. But what we see is that, in fact, a whole series of human behaviors 
uh, are transmitted through these networks, including from perfect strangers to us, but who happen to be part of this large interconnected web of social relationships. Now, it turns out that for both things like obesity and smoking, that over time, uh, what Christakis and Fowler and now others have found is that over time, the networks, uh, human networks have changed in important ways. One thing that's happening is that smokers are increasingly moving towards the periphery of those social networks. And that the smokers are beginning to cluster more and more closely together. Those are really, as it turns out, significant changes that we have not fully understood and utilized from a cessation perspective. The same thing is true exactly in terms of obesity, by the way. So I. Here's my concern with e-cigarettes. Um, thanks to the great work of Chris Bullen and colleagues, uh, it looks like there may be some utility in terms of helping individuals quit. That's a very good thing. My concern is the way that the devices look. And if smoking can be transmitted socially, if smoking and cessation are both uh, socially infectious, then if it looks like to a child you're smoking a cigarette, guess what's going to be conveyed? So if we have e-cigarettes, can we not turn them into devices that make it clear that the person is trying to quit? That sends a very different signal than one that says, I may be smoking, I can't really tell. Now, there's more that we can do. Uh, interesting, again, Cochrane Review that was just done showed that uh, uh, in uh, close to 150 different uh, randomized trials in school settings, that children who actually receive the standard interventions but also receive some social skills training, not refusal skills, but social skills training, were actually more likely to be able to stay smoke-free. That is, it enabled them to participate more fully in social networks. So, have we thought about providing social skills training for smokers? To help them locate and participate in supportive networks. To help them avoid the inhibitory influences that may exist in some of their existing social networks. Then there's the question of who we should focus on. An interesting simulation uh, was done not long ago that showed, in terms of dieting, that trying to have friends get together and quit wasn't particularly successful. Because both of them tended to go through waves of success and difficulties together. And so, in fact, what the simulation showed, and it is supported by uh, various data that um, suggests that the simulations are, are quite valid. That in fact, focusing on the friends of a person's friend ended up being much, uh, far more consistently influential in helping somebody quit. In other words, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the shape of the network. Remember, I said that smokers were being pushed out to the periphery of networks which means there's nobody behind them anymore. The only people they have to, to count on are the people that are standing beside them who are probably both smokers. And so we need to sort of encapsulate them. I'm not talking about quarantining people in the medical sense. I'm talking about nesting them within a supportive social environment surrounded by people who will support them, most of whom will not be modeling smoking, many of whom may have successfully quit smoking. So we need to get literally in front of and behind our smoking colleagues. We need to think about who are the key people within social networks 
So when you map a social network, what you find is that there are certain nodes and large numbers of people inevitably meet through a very small number of people. And the attitudes and the behaviors of those key individuals within social networks set the tone for much of the network. Now I learned this firsthand because I do a lot of work in Canada's Arctic with Canada's Inuit people who have a, a modest smoking rate of only 66%. There's only 28,000 of them. They live in, 95% of them live in 24 different villages. But it doesn't matter where they live geographically, it turns out they all have connections to certain networks. And so when you are in a place like Iqaluit, everyone wants to know if you came from Pang. Because what matters is whether or not you're part of the Pang network, which by the way is 500 kilometers from Iqaluit. So it's not geographic proximity, it's social proximity and, and, and uh, being part of social networks that matters to them. And it turns out that trying to give them support in Iqaluit, where they moved to 10 years ago, isn't as successful as going back to their hometown and influencing key members of their social networks. So how about future interventions for us focusing on recent quitters, friends of friends and surrounding them using things like Facebook as a virtual means of, of identifying networks. It's interesting, by the way, that the vast majority of connections that people use on Facebook are also people that are part of your social network, face-to-face -face networks. And so that's an interesting way of finding who's in an individual's network, how much contact they have, what level of integration, the nature of the relationship. And by the way, you can also uh, track down the friends of their friends and the friends of their friends' friends uh, through various means and some characters in the US uh, led by uh, Bond and colleagues. They wanted to know if they could change voter behavior. They wanted to know if they could increase the percentage of people that came out to vote. And so they went online on the day of the congressional elections in 2010 in the United States and they invited people, and they gave them information about where to vote and how to vote, and, or sorry, not how to vote, but, but how to get to polling stations. I wouldn't put it past some groups to tell you how to vote, but that's another, that's another uh, talk. Uh, but they conducted a randomized trial and some of those people also had a button that they could push that said, I voted, I've already voted. And it turns out that the, as you watch the number of your friends on Facebook increase in terms of how many said, yes, I've already voted, it had an effect on all the others who hadn't yet voted, like I gotta get out there and vote. It spread, it was contagious. Can we use those kinds of mechanisms in terms of cessation as we move forward? Let's change the dynamics of networks of people, not just individuals. Let's focus on changing the smoking status and attitudes of key nodes and influencers, and let's focus on reducing marginalization and increasing overall levels of social capital, especially trust. So let me wrap up with a few slides. There's an African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. Village is a Latin word, and it simply means a connected and organized assemblage of houses and people. Not disconnected, not random, organized and connected. That's a village. The word raise, I was asked the, uh, organizers if they could please be very careful with the spelling of the word raise in my title. I didn't want you to think that I was here to raise rates of tobacco, R-A-I-S-E, but raise, R-A-Z-E, comes from the Latin, again, meaning to erase, scratch out, eradicate, destroy, level to the ground. Those are terms that I love to associate with tobacco. So ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you, our village needs attention. And these are data from New Zealand, and New Zealand by and large has a pretty good record compared to many other nations. But we still only are average with respect to the OECD when it comes to things like income inequality, 
15% of our population still lives in discernible poverty, and that is a conservative estimate. 20% of uh, Kiwis do not have sufficient contact with family and friends, and 16% felt lonely for a significant point in some time in the past year, and a quarter had low levels of trust in others. We're marginalizing our smokers, we're pushing them to the periphery of our networks, and it's not helping. It's not helping us achieve our ultimate aim. So let me say, it will take a village, and we are the village, to raise tobacco. Let me reach to my East African colleagues for a humanist philosophy known as Mbutu, and Mbutu beautifully means simply, I am who I am because of who we all are. That is, we are interconnected. And I'm proud to be part of the tobacco control community, and I hope that, that you in turn are proud to be part of many communities, many villages, and collectively by working with and through our villages provides enormous potential for achieving our ultimate aim, which is enhancing health and well-being through the eradication or raising tobacco. Thank you very much.